<clears throat> well, good morning. Good morning. see everybody this morning. Thank you for the wishes this morning. Uh, we had originally, I had announced last Sunday that uh, we would perform the ordinance of baptism today. Uh, that has been postponed until next Sunday. So we will not be having the baptismal service at the end of the service today. If you're marking your Bibles, you're going to see that uh, around this time last year, we used the same verses of Scripture that we're going to talk about today. And it's pretty much the same thread of thought that we're carrying through this. You know, last time we talked about, uh, last year when we used this Scripture, we talked about uh, living on earth and longing for heaven. Well, today we're going to look at this verse of Scripture as having one foot on the earth and one foot in eternity. And we're once again going to be looking at, at the teachings of Paul. And if you would please stand and with me and turn to Philippians, the first chapter. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 26. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Paul said, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is a more necessary on your part, on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Amen. Father, we just thank you for Paul and for all the things that, that he wrote and that he taught us. He teaches us through your, your, uh, your word and your Bible this morning. And Father, we just uh, ask that you bless our time here together. And, and Father, just uh, help us to understand Paul's thinking when he wrote these scriptures. And Father, just help us to, to mine these scriptures for all of the things that you want us to know about this morning. Father, we just thank you for our time here and ask you to forgive us where we fail you. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You know, Paul's probably, or not probably, he's probably, he is the greatest man, I think, in, in other than Jesus Christ in the New Testament. I like to, to, to look at and to read all of the verses that, that Paul wrote, which is a plethora of stuff that he wrote in, in the New Testament. But this morning he was writing to a church that he had started on an earlier trip to Philippi. And if you want to know, then you look in, the, in uh, Acts chapter 16 and you'll see that story. We know that by reading that story that there wasn't enough men and uh, Jewish men to start a synagogue. So he went out and met with a group of people that was on the, the river bank there, a prayer group there, and he met with them. And he actually turned to the, to the Gentiles. And, and one member of that group was a business, very smart businesswoman named Lydia. And she actually off, offered to and volunteered to host a church in her house there in Philippi, and just a side note, that was the very first Christian church on European soil. You know, and I think that if you know, if we think about it, we can identify with Philippi because, like San Antonio, Texas, it was military city USA, but without the USA, because Philippi was a suburb, or it was near Rome, and a lot of the Roman soldiers went there to live out their retirement. Paul's primary concern for writing to the Philippian church was that he wanted to tell them thank you for all of the gifts that they had sent to him during his two-year arrest in Rome. And despite writing from prison, Paul emphasizes in the book of Philippians, like he does in all of his other writings, he, has, he carries that theme of joy all through his writings. In other words, no matter what your circumstances are, you can have a joyful life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we're going to focus on the tension 
that he felt he, as he was yearning for heaven and he was living this life here on earth to the fullest. And Paul puts it pretty well in, in his famous to be or not to be statement in verse 21 where he says, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now that's, that is pretty much the where I think I don't know this for a fact where Shakespeare got his famous line to be or not to be. But I think it's something for all of us to, to look at this morning and to think about is the, you know, what, where are we in our life this morning? Now, in the original Greek, that word or that verse is even brief, more, more brief than it is there. It says, for me to live Christ to die gain. That's what it says in the Greek. So really, what's Paul saying here? What kind of priority system does Paul have as he's writing these verses? And, and, and how does this help him live with one foot on earth and one foot in heaven? Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning. There's three things we're going to look at to help us maybe understand what Paul was thinking during the time that these verses were written. And the first thing is, is just like Paul, if we're true Christians, Christ is our life, our whole life. Now, we've talked about this concept before, but Paul absolutely demonstrates in his opening words, for me to live is Christ. Now, notice what Paul doesn't say in these verses. He doesn't say to live is to follow Christ. He doesn't say to live is to act like Christ. And he doesn't say to live is to ask yourself, what would Jesus do? All those are good things. But this is even more than that because Paul's life is just, it's orientated towards Christ. You know, it's wrapped up in Christ. His Lord is his all in all. It's the center of his world, his meaning and purpose in life, and his most precious possession. And it's the absolute definition of Paul's being, of who he is, of who, what Paul is about. All of Paul is found in all of Christ. So his life centers on serving and glorifying the Son of Christ, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in all that he does and all that he is. Now, like a lot of you, Paul was a type A personality. And we all know the story of how he became become Paul. You know, before he was Paul, he was Saul. He was a radical persecutor of Christian people. He hunted down and imprisoned a lot of Christians, and even sometimes he supervised their execution. He did all of that until Jesus blinded him on the Damascus Road, and then he, when he was blind, he heard Jesus ask him, why are you persecuting me, Saul? Well, instantly, for the first time in his life, Saul knew that Jesus was real, that he wasn't just a myth that was causing all these Jews to, to go down the wrong path. Jesus was really, truly risen from the dead and that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. And as Christ restored Saul's sight and he gave him his new name, Paul became a radical follower of the Lord. He did a 180-degree turn in the way he lived his life and in the way that he thought. Paul went on to study scriptures with a lot of the different Christians and for years, and he became the most fervent missionary of the Bible. He set up churches all over the Middle East and, and over in, and in Europe before his life was ended. And, you know, he just wanted, and he went to the Jews first. Being a Jew, he loved the Jews, and he went to the Jews first but he found most of the Jews would reject him. And then he went on to the non-Jews. He went to the Gentiles. In a lot of towns, he would go. The Jews would set against him. They would turn against him, and they would discredit him. And they tried to get him in trouble with all of the Roman authorities at the time in, in the area that he was at. You know, Paul suffered beatings and imprisonments. Uh, he, all of those mostly on trumped-up charges. He was shipwrecked on a prison ship. He was bitten by a poisonous snake. He was run out of town because of his faith. He was discredited. 
and cast out by all of his fellow Jews, and yet he could still say, to live is Christ. So that's telling us that nothing could defer, deter Paul from his faith. But what about you and I this morning? What would most of us say? To live is Christ, plus something else. Maybe that plus is work. Could be leisure, could be accumulating wealth, relationships. And sometimes even the plus part becomes the primary part, isn't it? For me to live is work. Or for me to live is golf. Or for me to live is food. And sometimes, we've talked about this before too, we're just kind of fair weather Christians, you know. Our lives would be centered on Christ as long as everything's going pretty, pretty smooth, right? Everything's good, we're going along pretty smooth. And then something happens. Then we stump our toe or somebody else stumps it for us. Then things kind of go bad. When we do that, we need to recall the words of Job where he said after he had lost it all, in chapter one, uh, 2, verse 10, he said, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And then he goes on in, when he sums up everything in chapter 1, verse 21, and he says, The Lord give and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Under all circumstances, we should remember that. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about why God allows bad things to happen to us. And he does it to build our character and to develop our faith on him. When we do that, when we find our life in Christ, that's, that's when we can truly be fulfilled and unruffled by all of the various up and downs that we know that we're going to have to deal with in this life that we live here on this fallen earth. And when we love Jesus, <clears throat> most everything else just kind of falls into place, right? You know, our relationships, our purpose in life, even death. And that's going to be our next point, is about death. If Christ is our life, then death has no fear in it, right? Sometimes, you know, you ask people how they do, and they say, well, you know, I'm vertical instead of horizontal. That's saying something. They say, well, at least I'm not six feet under. <clears throat> but I heard somebody say one time, well, everybody wants to go to heaven, and nobody wants to die. What's that old country and western song? Yeah. I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to go right now. That's most. That's probably the thought that most of us have. But but Paul had a different take on that, because he said, "For me, to live is Christ," and then he would also say, "To die is gain." Paul knew that death was actually a profitable thing for him, because in verse twenty-three he says, "I desire to depart." and be with Christ. Now, this commentary that I looked at here said that the word depart is in, in the Greek is really a beautiful word. It's a word that uh, leads you to, to like pull up your tent stakes or pull up the anchor of your boat. Uh, you're going on a, a, a voyage. You're going on a vacation, you know. And Paul was simply saying that if he died, then he was setting off on a new experience something different, something to look forward to, something to take pride in, something to take joy in, a totally new experience. <coughs> so did Paul have a death wish? Was this a suicidal statement that he was making? Nah, not at all. It wasn't. Paul knew that if we love Christ on faith in this world, strictly on faith, we're going to see him as through a glass darkly. But following his death, but following our death, he knew and we know that we're going to see our Savior face to face, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I'm known. Amen? We're going to be known in heaven, and we are going to know in heaven that our faith on this earth in Jesus Christ was absolutely justified. Amen? Amen. 
The one thing that we really don't have to have in heaven is faith. Right? Because we don't won't have to believe in just something with faith. We're going to see Jesus Christ face to face with our own eyes, and we're going to be him be with him forever in heaven. <clears throat> Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, he said, To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us the moment that we die, our next conscious awareness is we're going to be seeing our Lord and Savior face to face, alive and in vivid color, right? You know, Paul in his letter said that he was torn. He was torn between living and dying. It's not as if he was deciding whether to commit suicide or not. He's just saying, if I had the choice, would I keep living or would I prefer to die? That's what he's asking. Paul said that for him that, that death would be far better because then he would be with his Lord face to face with him forever. Now when you consider the trials that he had been through, you know, you can't fault Paul for, for really wanting some peace for a change, some peace in the presence of his Lord and Savior. On the other hand, Paul knew that there was still work to be done and, and he knew that people still needed to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and all the churches like the ones in Philippi could benefit from his guidance because Paul had a sense that God was not done with him yet wasn't done with him here on this earth and if you look at that in that tense or, and the tension that Paul was under he really had nothing to fear from death you know, Christians ought to be, of all people in the world, should not fear death. In fact, when we lose somebody that we love, somebody that's close to us, the Bible tells us in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, a lot of this is, this is used a lot of time at funerals. It says, we grieve as those with hope because we know our separation is only temporary for those who belong to the Lord. Therefore, thus death has lost its sting. You know, I ask myself sometimes, what's the very worst thing could happen to me? Okay, I could die. But then I'd be with Jesus, right? That's not a bad deal, is it? To live is Christ, to die is gain. You know, if as Christians, if we would develop this attitude, if we had this attitude, then we're going to be able to live with one foot on the earth and one foot on and eternity in heaven. You know, you might think that that would make us no, so heavenly minded that we'd be no earthly good. But that's actually the opposite is true when you look at Paul. And that brings us to our final point this morning. Living with one foot in eternity helps us to live far better lives here on earth right now. And, and Paul is the best example of that, that that we can pick out of the New Testament. His only choice in his mind was between two good things. You know, he could either go to Jesus soon or he could tarry longer on earth and help more people follow Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and, you know, once he put it into words, I think, it become evident to him that, that God would would leave him here on the earth just a little bit longer. And it be it could be that he sensed that the charges that were trumped up against him in the first place were going to go away or were going to just maybe evaporate. And because he had no fear of death, he was able to serve the Lord without any fear of the consequences. And he saw how the Lord intended to use him to assist with the progress of the Philippians and their church. You know, as they, the Philippians continued to grow in their faith. So with eternity in mind, Paul was able to focus on what was truly important. Now one of the commentaries that I read said, Such singular focus does not make Paul otherworldly. Rather, it gives heart and meaning to everything that he is and does as a citizen of two worlds. His heavenly citizenship determining his earthly citizenship. So Paul highlights the tension and 
it's the same kind of tension, I think, that, that you and I experience in our life here on earth. You know, we naturally learn, yearn for our heavenly home. If we weren't looking for a heavenly home, we wouldn't be in this place this morning. And yet, we also want to live. We want to live here and continue to live with my wife and, and with all of you as my friends and, and my support group. But you know, once you've settled where you're heading, you don't have to worry so much about when you're going to get there, right? We're all free to devote all of ourselves to God's Word, knowing that He's going to bring us home in the right time. So this morning, out of this verse of Scripture, we see in Paul's to live is to Christ, to die is gain, we learn a new boldness, a single-mindedness, and a fearless approach to death when God brings it into our lives, into our family, into our acquaintances. What we have to do is we can serve God fully while we're with yearning expectations for the life that's to come. You know, our prayer ought to be every morning is God help us to wake up every day not worrying a bit about when or how we're going to die. We ought to pray that instead that we would yield our lives to God. Help us to live our lives to yield our lives to you, God. And just help us to be able to see the ways that you want us to grow your kingdom as we share our faith with others. Amen. That ought to be our daily prayer. We're going to stand and sing. Hymn number 482 is our invitation this morning. Jesus is calling. And if Jesus is calling you, you come as we sing this morning. Accept him this morning, and you will gain dual citizenship. You'll have citizenship here on earth. You'll also have citizenship in heaven. And we'll be able to live with one foot on earth and one foot in heaven. So you come this morning.